obvious question, which is how on earth did you end up making this film? <laughs> So um, my producer on this film, Marie Therese Girgis, she knew Steve Bannon when he was her boss for three years. Uh, he got a group of investors together and they bought uh, an art house film distribution company called Wellspring Media. And she had this working relationship with him. Um, they fell out of touch. And when he joined the Trump campaign in August 2016, she used the fact that she knew how to get a hold of him to express her displeasure <laughs> um, and send him some, uh, you know, it's a, an angry letter. And he wrote back. And that kind of became this uh, re, you know, reconnecting in which she told him what he thought, what she thought about, uh, you know, the campaign. And then once he was in the White House, and he was always writing back. And she felt like this was a, personal catharsis for her, but you know, something that maybe could be something more. And so she asked him if he would uh, agree to do a documentary like this, where a filmmaker would have, you know, this kind of access, but she said, I'll get a great filmmaker uh, and it'll be really prestigious and, you know, really played into his vanity and also his idea that he's not only an important guy, but he's someone who frankly, wants to be part of the kind of cultural elite as well. I think she was really leaning hard on that. Um, he said no several times, and then he said yes, uh, and then that's when I got the call. And um, yeah, the we were always on the same page that this was the way to make the film, even though, you know, for her, it was like a very informed calculation because since she knew him, um, she knew that, you know, he was the kind of guy who would be, uh, very tricky to nail down in an interview kind of context. Um, you know, he enters everything in a combative way. He changes the subject. It's just, it's not a good faith, um, you know, it wouldn't be a good faith exchange and kind of what would be the point. And for me, I was like, yeah, to follow Bannon, I didn't, I mean, I only had this very simple image of him, but I knew like that would get me in the room in all kinds of, you know, situations with, the far right, the Republican Party, and I thought that was an amazing opportunity to see what was going to come down the pike. And so I met him in fall of 2017. And when you met him, what was sort of your impression or, you know, how you kind of enter that situation meeting him? So uh, the first time was with without a camera, um, and it was September. It was like just a few weeks after he left the White House. Uh, and we're made to wait many hours, um, which is very typical now. I did. Then I learned of coming to have a meeting with Bannon. And um, we get we sit at the kitchen table and he walks in the room and he's just like talking a mile a minute. Um, and he struck me, I didn't know what he was gonna be like physically. I only saw just kind of the gross pictures. You know, those are like the least flattering pictures that were out there and he's, you know, he's uh, the Grim Reaper on SNL. But like to actually meet him, he walked in and I was like, he struck me as like actually kind of avuncular. And he was, um, and and in, in the first 10 seconds, I was like, okay, this guy is gonna say some shit. I mean, like it was clear that he didn't really have a filter. Um, but I also felt like, um, not intimidated, but I just decided that he was also no joke uh, in terms of, you know, he was he was so hyped up, he had just filmed the Charlie Rose interview he did for 60 Minutes, and I think he just had this excess energy from all the prep he had done, and so he just wanted to say stuff, so he's like throwing out stats, and then he's bringing up, you know, a Civil War battle, and then something about ancient Rome, and it's like, you know, I was like, okay, this whole plan is going to work if you know, I give it time and I really need to observe him. Like, it's not about just jumping in with this guy. Like, you know, that's that's going to be the plan. But I did feel like he was going to be a good character who would probably reveal himself um, through his actions without knowing it. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so, so you're following him around. You know, you're not shooting all the time, but you're shooting a lot of the time. How does that, how does that work as a documentarian for you? How, what's your day like? That's such a good question. Um, so, you know, when uh, there's all kinds of work done to figure out, you know, where he's going to be. And so I am in the place where he's, you know, going to be, whether it's D.C. or on a trip. He, in particular, makes very last minute travel plans. And that was something that was really challenging. And 
also, you know, you don't have infinite resources uh, <laughs> for, for production. So I would always kind of wait until he, until his team said, you know, would give me their flight information. And I knew there was actually a flight booked, which seemed like a good chance that they were actually going to the place that they said they were going. Um, and then I would, you know, be on a plane. I would, I tried to have all my stuff really compact because it was just me as a one person crew. Um, and, you know, when I'm, when I'm going to work for the day, it's like I go to wherever he is. It's either I'm waiting in the lobby of the hotel he's staying or I'm waiting in the downstairs of his house. Um, and I've got like a giant fanny pack with all my like batteries and cards and release forms <laughs> and a uh, camera on a monopod. And then I'm just waiting to get in the room and I'm bugging his team about, you know, when can I go? And if I feel like I'm being obstructed, I maybe text him to sort of see if I, you know, be like, what's going on? I'm down, just letting you know, <laughs> like I'm here. Um, and once I kind of would get in, my first goal was always put the microphone on him, like get him to wear the, the wireless lav. And then it's just kind of, who's he gonna be meeting with and are they gonna to agree to be filmed? Because this, you know, the idea of getting access is not just that first agreement with him. The whole point, especially with Verite, was about seeing him in action. So, um, you know, sometimes his staff would prep people before they came in and they might come up and say, next guy doesn't want to be filmed and then I would always just try not to get booted all the way back to the lobby <laughs> like I was like maybe I'll just wait outside the door or something just so that I would because I feel like once I was in it might be like I could spend eight ten hours with him but once I'm out you know maybe I'll never get back in does that sort of answer? yeah well I mean I'm and I'm thinking specifically of the of the scene uh, with the dinner in Europe and the all those people in the room can you talk about that in particular yeah and I think that was kind of the real turning point of when I started to have really really good access it, I had been filming maybe for about seven or eight months not every day you know and it really from that point on it picked up in a more regular way I would say because um, that was the summer of 2018 but I was staying in that hotel. It was one of the few times I was staying in the very expensive hotel where he was, as opposed to like a cheap place around the corner. Um, and it really paid off because from being around, I was able to just hop into the Paul Lewis interview where he first meets him in London and he's asking him, you know, what's your plan? And Bannon was kind of pitching him on, there's gonna be this dinner, you should come, I'll get you in. Um, which I think was really him already trying to like feed the story. Um, but then of course, Bannon talks a big game and doesn't actually facilitate that for him or let him know, but I had heard it. So then I spent the rest of the day, you know, I was like, oh, I really want to get in. Uh, Bannon said, yeah, you like, yeah, totally. You should come. And so then I, the, all the people at that dinner were in town for a Tommy Robinson, free Tommy Robinson rally um, that Raheem had organized. And Tommy Robinson is kind of this, um, you know, a, a bizarre, a very anti-Islam kind of racist, like, you know, working class guy figure in the UK um, who we were turning it into a free speech issue that he was in jail and it's like a long story, but he basically was like Raheem's Rolodex of people who were gonna do this rally. And those were, that was like the guest list for that dinner, including sitting Arizona Congressman Paul Gosar. Um, who did participate in that rally. Um, and so I go up, so, so then I go to Raheem and I say, oh, here, there's a dinner tonight, you know, uh, be great to film. He's like, oh no, you can't do that. I was like, well, Steve really wants it. He thinks it's really important for the movie. <laughs> and um, he didn't really argue with me as much. So I was like, okay, we're good. Um, before the dinner, I went up to put the microphone on on Bannon and he was like, oh, I'm sorry. I." I don't think I can put it on. I don't think we can do this. There's going to be a congressman there. And, and I think that changes things. Like we need to make sure he's okay with it. So, I mean, you, sorry, but you got to understand. And I was really seething because the worst thing you could do to me is tell me I can't film. <laughs> it's like the main thing I cared about all the time. So I followed him back downstairs and I just kind of waited in uh, the room, kind of in the same hallway with the security guard who was like eating his dinner. And as um, Gosar is being walked in by one of S Steve's staff, uh, I overhear him being asked, you know, oh, we, it, you know, by the way, we have this um, independent filmmaker with us. She's doing a documentary about like the populist movement. You know, would you mind if she filmed some of this dinner? And he says, oh, sure, no problem. And I just like 
them like right right as if it was like you know getting information i started like following them and turned the camera on and walked into the dinner um and pan was like whoa, whoa what's going on like is this and you know, he said yes and so then i was introduced to the room everyone said it was cool and that was one of the things that i got to film from start to finish and so i felt like it was um and obviously it's a very important scene in the film um <clears throat> One thing that you and I have talked about is whether the film humanizes him and how you thought about that and, and what kind of what filmmaker responsibility is in the, in the in that area. So how do you think about that? So um, you know, I think the the reality is we're all humans, right? So like even the term of like humanizing someone, um, it's sort of like something you have to be like, well, what do we mean by that? You know, I do think when you're doing a verite film, part of what you're doing is trying to show a person in a kind of more three-dimensional, you know, in, in many contexts. Um, but I think in this case, because my interest in him and this project was more to ask the questions, kind of bigger questions than just, just you know, him, truly it wasn't, what, my motivating question was not what is in Steve Bannon's heart, it was really, what is he doing? Who is he doing it with? Um, what are they gonna do next? You know, like the, that, and so to me, um, to show him as a, as a human doing that um, would be, I, I, what I needed to do is make sure that the film showed that these were the questions that it was interested in and not just being like, look, I have access. Look, I can show another side of him. But that, it, I mean, in, inevitably that would come through um, but I actually think it ends up being more chilling if you disagree with what he's doing and if you find what he's doing to be um, dangerous for our country, for the world, you know, on the wrong side of history. Um, I actually think having this one dimensional, I mean, and this is something that emerged from doing this project. You know, when I started, again, I wasn't interested in him personally. I wasn't fascinated with Steve Bannon. Um, I just knew him as this evil, you know, villain. And it was this very one-dimensional thing that I now understand um, actually conferred a great amount of power to him. And he really kind of loved it and was able to build up his own kind of personal cachet in the political world and internationally because of it. So in this case, I feel like, you know, the human aspect of him actually kind of makes him smaller than life, like kind of brings him down to size, which is a more powerful critique but again, it had to be done really right. And so that's why, you know, the film, you know, isn't, you know, there's there are things like the green juice and there is lots of humor. He also is really self-aware at times. At other times, he's not. But like when he is, he can be very self-deprecating. And I also think that helps make it watchable as a film and like more entertaining. But I really feel like the fact that, you know, the, the people who are doing you know, damaging things to the world, in my opinion, you know, that they are just people is something we lose sight of. And I think documentary is a great way to give people that, that, you know, bigger picture. Um, I think we can open it up for some questions. Um, do we have a mic or no? We do. Okay, just speak loudly and I'll, I'll repeat your question. Oh, it's okay, if we don't have a mic. Yeah. Um, okay, so yes, right in the back there. So no mic? No, yeah. just... All right. First, thanks for correcting his pronunciation of Wangsha. <laughs> no problem. Second, did you get any better sense of how populism is defined as a broader movement? Because it looks like from the film that it comes in different flavors depending on which country you're talking about. And I want to know if you got the sense that it was getting any closer to some more unified vision of the West is key tenets of. Um, just to repeat, it's a question about did you feel like you got a better sense of really what the populist movement is for making this? I mean, when you see in the like cards when I use the word populism, even I like put it in quotations. I think populism is still, it's a, it is a very amorphous term, even if you go in a deeper dive of how, you know, historians, social scientists, you know, political scientists are talking about it right now. I mean, I think it's, it's enough of a, of a gray area term that that's why he is, you know, that he's trying to kind of seize it and to infuse it with his uh, flavor and his definition. I also think the fact that, you, that people talk about left-wing populism and right-wing populism is also helpful 
for him to kind of, I think it's another way of like legitimizing what he's doing and saying, oh, it's just a different flavor or it's, you know, or these are two, you know, they're the same thing, but you know, on the opposite ends of the spectrum. Um, so I would say for me, um, I still am very wary of how to use the term. And I think that certainly when it comes to Bannon, it, this whole thing, that plus his economic nationalism, I think all of it is really a branding exercise and it's kind of putting this wrapper of an economic lens around something that is some combination for him of, you know, a cynical tactic or, and, or, you know, and a, a more kind of white nationalist view of things, um, you know, and, and what that percentage is, you know, it's, it's, I think it's some amount of both, um, but, you know, populism, if it's about really the, you know, this idea that there is a will of the people, first of all, is I think also something that is really complicated, you know, in democratic elections, it's the majority rules, it's not the will of the people, someone can win 51% or they can win the electoral college in less than the majority and then that becomes the will of the people. Um, so to me, it still feels like a dangerous term, especially because his side is really trying to like wear it. Yeah, so what's the plan to get this film distributed in the red states? So, yeah. Distribution plans in red states. So, I mean, we're lucky that um, Magnolia Pictures actually supported this film from, you know, the basically the beginning. And this is just opening weekend, and it's going to roll out right now. It's, I think, booked in at least like 50 markets. Um, so that definitely includes red states. I think it's tough, though, if you're thinking like, how, what, how is this going to be delivered to like, you know, viewers who are his supporters or Trump yeah. supporters. And really, if you think about it, I mean, he even though you see he has a bunch of like fangirls and stuff like that, but he doesn't really have like supporters the way that there's like Trump has supporters, which I think is why he's very careful not to um, say bad things about Trump. Um, but, you know, for this film, I do think it you know, it's not really meant as a persuasion tool. Um, and because, A, that's just not how the kind of films I would do, as you know. And, and I also don't, I almost don't know how to make something like that. I mean, I think I made the, this film with, that, with the guiding values that I have as a human, as a citizen of this country. So, like, I have politics and I feel like that's allowed to inform how I make it. Um, and the ethics of filmmaking, you know, and treating the subject fairly. But, you know, I kind of can't say that I know how to make it for, you know, what does it mean for a left-wing audience and what does it mean for a right-wing audience? I mean, I just, I feel like I, I, I do feel like it's something that is resonating for people who have an open mind, you know, and, and could be from the center or the left or, you know, and, and, um, you know, it's not made exclusively for them though. So mm -hmm. yeah, so I hope that people see it. I do feel like I can tell that it's something that's a little more, you come because you think Bannon is scary and you, I applaud, yay, like you wanna know more. Um, but I think if you come and you support him, you know, I'd love to hear what you think, but you know, um, the, the treatment's really fair. So, you know, I think there is a possibility for people to not see it as like a partisan hack kind of job. But on the other hand, things are a Rorschach text test these days, right? So there, there's a whole worldview baked into like his supporters. And I, you know, I don't know if they would get like the irony of the woman saying it's a no propaganda, you know, after he has said many times that it's propaganda, you know, like I, I just, I don't know. Um, uh, you and, yeah. After um, making the film, would you give more credit or less credit to Bannon for the rise of uh, uh, Trumpism? Uh, or would you, would there be Bannon without Trump or Trump without Bannon? Or do you think they just kind of met like in a political right wing dating service? <laughs> they parasites that just kind of fed off each other yeah. at the right moment. It's such a good way to ask that actually like I feel like I get asked questions that are like near that but that's like a really good way to phrase it um I think that 
in the in the broad sense of more credit or less credit, I kind of think a little bit less credit uh, in because I think part of his game is is to take credit for stuff, and I think that's what we're going to see going forward. But it was really important to me in this film, though, that it's not a black and white thing, and it's not about um, you know saying diminishing him and therefore saying so now you don't have to worry or like this is just a clown because I think that would be a really big mistake too and that's why I said I never underestimated him as a filmmaker and I do think as an audience and member and as you know a citizen of the world you you know you don't want to underestimate it because he's been doing what he's been doing it was a hobby you know politics was a hobby for him and it slowly became something that you know he figured out how to use data and tech in, in certain ways. He figured out how to use, you know, ma making propaganda films, He, you know, the conservative talk radio. And he's really someone who has, I, I think, no bottom, you know, like, and that, I think that's a very dangerous, you know, enemy or, you know, it's a very potent ally at, when it came to advising Trump. I think that, you know, at, he came into that campaign very late and I don't know how to say, I feel like it's counterfactual. I don't know how to say, like, he definitely would have lost without Bannon. Like, I'm just not sure how to know that that's true, but I think that he was there on that team and he was encouraging, like, the, you know, the the worst nature of Trump when things went down and he just said, double down and don't apologize and, you know, uh, play to the base, keep on with this message. Um, and that worked, uh, but I, you know, I don't know if it's like only him. And I, I worry about the Europe with the European stuff. It's the same thing. There's he's doing things, you know, and um, and he's not dumb. On the other hand, I, it's not Bannon's Europe, you know, and all those headlines. And you're going to keep you'll notice them more now that like kind of write about it that way. That's giving him way too much credit. So part of me feels like how much credit also he deserves going forward is like kind of it's it continues to be how much also credit and space people give him like you know is Trump going to invite him back into the circle for 2020 I mean that's up to Trump that's not up to like Bannon but he's he's tireless in in his work I don't think he's always working in the most brilliant ways it's very disorganized his team is very small but um he's just willing to you know spread conspiracies and use dog whistles and um, and and deal with money very shadily. So, you know, I think he's still very much a threat, but I think acting like he's the guy that at all these things hinge on is totally wrong. You like, I hope this film also encourages people to see it all as like a systemic thing. Just one other short thing. Did you learn anything about his personal and social life? His family life? His family life? Yeah, um, I mean, I met his uh, father who I did interview. It just didn't really fit in the film. He uh, still lives in Virginia, and he's in his like mid nineties. Um, and met his then his stepmother, um, and I I never saw him with any of his daughters. It just never worked out. I was going to try to film him with Maureen, the oldest, who's at West Point. She works there. Um, he talks about both his father and his daughter a lot in speeches, um, and you know his his family is important to him. But really, I feel like. The movie is was partly it's it's all about me trying to give you the best balance of what I think in 90 minutes how to distill my 13 months into the most important 90 minutes for you and I think his line about what is a personal life is really the be the most important thing about about, about him because like yes of course he I mean maybe not of course but he loves his father and you know I mean he's had three marriages and he has three kids <laughs> and um, you know he. Uh, but he's not like traveling with a girlfriend that I didn't show. He, I knew he was seeing someone, but she, it's not like she was coming around places. Um, and really, I think he's a he's a workaholic, you know, and and he is fueled by Red Bull and a feeling of historical importance. And I don't think he's like fueled by like love for his family and the like number one thing that is motivating him. I think we have time for one more. Um, yeah. And um, Terry is asking what his reaction was to the film and what kind of input he had on what was and was not included in. Do you, do you have 
Yeah, that was, um, what was his reaction to the film and what kind of input did he have or didn't he have? Yeah, so we would would not have done it if he could have any input at all. So, you know, the part of the release agreement also made it clear that, you know, as between, uh, as between me and him, I just want to make sure my grammar is right. Uh, you know, I had, you know, total creative control. He has a lot of control though in terms of if he doesn't tell me things or tells me I can't film things. So, um, and I think that is fine and fair and typical of any, you know, uh, a documentary project like this, even when the filmmaker is politically aligned with the subject, you know, um, you know, uh, and, um, so yeah, my producer showed it to him uh, the week before Sundance. So it was like in an almost finished state. Um, and you know, he the way she describes it is it was a weird experience for him, which makes a lot of sense because you know it's a lot of hours turned into a movie again that was totally not his. And I a hundred percent know he would not make this movie. Um, and. You know, he kept talking about how fat he looked and oh, I gotta lose weight, as you might imagine. Um, some thing, you know, there were things that he, you know, he kind of did love it, didn't hate it, and was kind of asking, you know, she was able to kind of spin it for him. Again, this is like a verite, it's a very fair treatment. There's not really anything to say like, oh, this is a false or, you know, twisted. Um, but I think he was reserving judgment to see how it would be taken in the wider world. And once the reviews started coming out, which really, you know, to say the film is critical, but not in the ways that he's used to, um, you know, e evil genius is not, you know, genius is not one of the words that people are really using. Um, he's cut off all contact with my producer from that point on. Um, I also have to say though, and I, we're getting the wrap up, yeah. or yeah. The like last thing though is, you know, because I don't, you know, for a lot of reasons, you know, there was a part of me that, you know, because I didn't want this to be a film that was, uh, you know, aiding his cause in any way. There was like a temptation to be really, concerned about what he thought about the movie, right? And he's someone who says in the film, I mean, I purposely put it in the film, talking about the way, you know, he uses the media um, and uh, to his advantage. Um, and I, I do think that that really is more talking about the daily news kind of cycles because he's never had a movie like this made about him and I don't think he imagined what it could be in the correct way. Um, but I just had to decide and my team helped get me there, but it's like, you know, the least important audience member for this film is Steve Bannon. <laughs> and I really feel like, you know, I I have, I, I wanted this to be there for you, the audience, and for history, and I feel like it is an expression of what I saw and what I wanted to share, and so, you know, he'll say whatever he says. <laughs> um, I'm sure he's saying stuff off the record, because that's what he likes to do, but um, yeah, I think he's the least important audience member for this film. Well, thank you very much for being here, and thank you all for being here. Thank you. Elizabeth.